Welcome, bienvenue. My name is Renee Ketchum and I curate the cultural offerings of AFUSA. And I'm honored to welcome everyone today to Proust versus Colette, a conversation with Antoine Compagnon from the Academy, l'Academie Française. Un grand merci to our sponsors, France Today and Bonjour Paris. AFUSA is the largest Alliance Française network in the world, helping 25,000 learners of French each year learn French, live French, and love French. Visit your local chapter or AFUSA.org to learn about some of our wonderful national events coming up. Um, we have Le Cercle Rouge or the, with the Melville Foundation, Sarah Bernhardt, how to Retire in France with our, one of our favorites, Adrienne Leeds, and again, One Film, One Federation, a discussion of Bob Le Flambeau. A few logistics. Please stay on mute during the presentation. Stay on speaker view. Please put all of your questions in the chat. And if you have technical issues, sign back in in a couple of minutes using the original Zoom link. This event is being recorded for our YouTube channel, and the total runtime will be one hour. I'm honored to introduce Antoine Compagnon, Professor Emeritus of French Literature at Collège de France and the Blanche W. Knopp Professor of French and Comparative Literature at Columbia University, author of Proust Entre Deux Siècles, Ciel, 1989, and En été avec Colette, Équateur, France Inter, 2022. Equally as thrilled to introduce my friend Farish Day Priu. Farish Day is the founder of the Proust Society of Greenwich, a nonprofit literary group. Her website will be in the chat, but it is the ProustSociety.org. Since 2007, Farish Day has been leading a monthly Proust discussion group engaged in close reading of A la Recherche du Temps Perdu. The group started its fourth round of reading Proust in January 2023. Welcome, Farish Day. Welcome, Antoine. Thank you, Rene. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to our today's event. Uh, Professor Companion, it's an honor and a thrill uh, to have you with us today to talk about these two great stars of French literature, Proust and Colette, who were contemporaries and knew each other. Uh, Proust is, of course, considered one of the most influential writers of the 20th century. And Colette is one of the most beloved female authors in France. She is the first woman author who was granted the state funeral in France, which is quite extraordinary. Her writings about women experiences at the time was quite uh, revolutionary. However, um, some people might uh, say that her work lacks the complexity and voluminosity of Proust's work. So a lot of people might wonder why um, you have chosen um, Colette as the literary personality to compare to Proust. Uh, what is your response to, to that? Oh, you're muted. Um, Yes, I think now I'm unmuted. Yes, yeah. Well, uh, thank you for organizing this event. I'm glad to discuss Proust and Colette uh, with you. You notice that I'm teaching uh, at this point a seminar at Columbia, which is called uh, Proust uh, versus Colette. So I should explain probably why uh, I decided to uh, teach such a seminar. And I think there are both, I would say, uh, personal reasons and uh, more objective reasons. First about the, let's say, the personal reasons. Uh, as you know, as you introduced me, uh, I've been working on Proust for mm, almost 40 years, even more than 40 years, since the early 1980s. Uh, when uh, I started working on the uh, edition of uh, Proust's novel for the, the new Pleiad that was being realized in the uh, 1980s. Uh, so uh, the work on Proust is really uh, 
yes, has been uh, long standing. Uh, now, uh, Colette, how did I start working on Colette? Uh, uh, what happened is that uh, uh, in this uh, series of uh, radio broadcasts that I've been doing for France Inter, uh, which started in the, I think the first one was on Montaigne. I think it was in 2012, I would say. Uh, I have done uh, year after year a number of uh, these uh, uh, radio broadcasts uh, on France Inter for the summer. I did uh, Montaigne, I did uh, Baudelaire one year, Pascal. And uh, I think that it was when I uh, was invited by France Inter when the book uh, on Pascal, because the book always uh, came out uh, a year after the radio shows. Uh, I was on France Inter at uh, the radio one morning uh, discussing the book on Pascal. And on the phone, there was a woman who said, uh, but you've done only men in this series of on uh, French authors. It's, it's only men. This is... Uh, this is not good. This is not acceptable. There should be a woman at some point. And I said, well, uh, I would enjoy doing Colette. And at, at, after the, when I left the studio, the radio studio, the head of uh, France Inter, Laurence Bloch, uh, who is now a good friend, told me, well, let's do uh, Colette next year. So uh, I was, uh, I had to do Colette. Uh, of course, I know Colette uh, well, I say quite well, I would say for at least two reasons. Uh, the first reason is when, when I was in uh, primary school in the 1950s uh, in Ecole Primaire, uh, Colette was really a, uh, a fixture of the dictée in, in the 1950s, uh, all French children were well acquainted with uh, Colette's uh, work. I would say we had uh, dictates from uh, uh, La, La Maison de Claudine, which was probably the most popular of her books, uh, The House of Claudine, description of the village, the parents, uh, all, the, uh, all that went on in this uh, little village of uh, deep uh, France. So, Colette belongs to uh, my the deepest of my culture. And then, as you also know, I've been teaching at Columbia for many years. Next year, it will be 40 years teaching at Columbia. So over the years, uh, there was, let's say, a desire to uh, introduce women in the syllabi. Uh, at Columbia, in most, in all American universities. So I've been teaching Colette uh, quite regularly at Columbia. I introduced, uh, I would say, most of the novels of Colette uh, in various uh, courses and seminars at Columbia, uh, the Claudine uh, series, uh, uh, the uh, Chéri, of course, uh, La Fin de Chéri, The End of Chéri, which is a great book on uh, World War I and on the end of the consequences of World War I, uh, the, uh, the issue of uh, demobilization. Uh, of course, uh, I taught uh, Le Blé en Herbe, uh, uh, La Naissance du Jour, Break of Day, uh, the, Le Pur et l'Impur. So, Gigi, uh, I taught over the years many of those uh, great books by Colette. So, uh, I accepted to do the radio series on Colette a couple of years ago. I can't remember when. It was probably 2020 or 2021. And I enjoyed doing it a lot. It was easier than Pascal. Uh, it, was, it was a joy to work on Colette. To re I spent a summer reading the four volumes of the Pleiad, and it's four volumes. So it's a, it's a huge, uh, Colette worked 
wrote for, I mean, Colette died much older than Proust. Proust died when he was 50. Colette died when she was 80. So, uh, so she, 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 she had time to write uh, uh, still more than Proust. So uh, I enjoyed it so much that, uh, uh, well, I thought I shouldn't stop working on Colette. Uh, and what happened also is that in 2021 and 2022, I was uh, mobilized by the uh, celebration first in 2021 of uh, uh, the birth of Proust 150 years earlier in 1871. And then in uh, uh, 2022, uh, the centenary of the death of Proust in uh, 1922. For, for two years, I was heavily mobilized by Proust. I organized two exhibitions, uh, one that took place at the Bibliothèque Nationale called La Fabrique de l'Oeuvre, which was really on how the novel came to be. And the other exhibition uh, was at the uh, Musée d'Art et d'Histoire et du Judaïsme, the Jewish Museum in Paris. Uh, the exhibition was called Proust du Côté de la Mer, Proust on the Mother's Side. And at that time, I had, I had written a book which came out the same year called uh, Proust du Côté Juif. So on the Jewish side of Proust, uh, this book is now translated and will come out at Columbia University Press to, under the title Proust, uh, I forget the title now, Proust, A Jewish Way. Uh, so this will come out in a couple of months in English. So I was quite busy with Proust for two years, uh, 21, 22, uh, because of those centennials. And suddenly, without realizing that uh, another commemoration would happen, uh, that Colette was born in 1873. So suddenly in 2023, this year, I was thrown into, without expecting it, it was totally improvised. I was thrown into the celebration of Colette. When I did those radio uh, broadcasts a couple of years ago, and when I published uh, An Ete avec Colette, uh, Summer with Colette, probably two years ago, Nobody thought of the centennial. It was out of the landscape. While the centennial of Proust had been planned for at least three years, because when you do an exhibition, you have to start preparing it at least two or three years earlier. With Colette, nothing was planned. And suddenly at the end, just a year ago, at the end of 2022, I was uh, thrown into this celebration uh, you might have noticed that I did a, a sort of a small Pleiad, an anthology of Colette for the Pleiad. Uh, we started it last October, so it was very, everything was improvised on about Colette. Uh, the Pleiad came out in uh, February 23, and then all through 23, I was uh, involved in various celebrations of uh, the uh, birth of Colette 150 years ago in uh, February uh, 1873. Uh, last week I was in, uh, in Europe and I even spoke of Colette in uh, Monaco, in Monte Carlo. Uh, you uh, might uh, remember that Colette was a very good friend of the prince Pierre de Monaco, who was the father of uh, Prince Régnier de Monaco and the father of uh, Prince Albert de Monaco. So the grandfather of the present ruler of Monaco. And so they wanted to organize a celebration. Colette was very close to the Prince Pierre uh, in the last years of her life, she, she went every summer for a good month in Monaco as a guest of uh, 
the prince Pierre and the prince Rainier. Uh, by the way, uh, Pierre de Monaco, who was born Comte de Polignac, was also a friend of Proust. It's another connection. There are many, many connections between Colette and Proust. Uh, this is another one, uh, their, their Monaco connection. So I was in Monaco last week to speak of Colette in front of the family of uh, 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 Prince Albert and uh, high school students. It was a very nice combination of people for a commemoration of Colette. So Colette has kept me very busy this oh. year, 2023, after uh, Proust kept me very busy in 21 and 22. So uh, that's why I decided to have a seminar on Proust and Colette. And of course, there are also very obvious reasons which are not as, uh, let's say, circumstantial. Uh, Proust was born in, as I said, in 1871. Colette was born in 1873. They belong to exactly the same generation. They are the same age. They have the same culture. They frequented the same milieu in Paris in the 1890s. Uh, and they are uh, members of this group that I call uh, the, the group des six, the group of six who are really the modern classics of French literature. Uh, these great writers were born in just a couple of years, Valéry, Gide, Claudel, Proust, Colette, and Peggy. The six, these six writers were really the most important. Many of them linked with the NRF, the Nouvelle Revue Française, were born between 1869 and 1873. In four years, they were all born. And they are really the writers, modern classics, who occupied the first half of the 20th century, and especially uh, the years after World War I, the 1920s, the 1930s, were the years where they were at their peak. They were in their 50s, and they were the major writers. Of course, Peggy died uh, during World War I in September 1914. Proust died in 1922. The others survived World War II until uh, Valéry died in 49, uh, Gide in 51. So they, they lived after World War II. So it's a great generation. Mm -hmm. Colette belongs fully to that group and to that generation. Moreover, we can say that she is the only woman in this group of six. And we can also say that she's probably the most uh, popular writer uh, with Proust, with Proust. Nowadays, if I think of this group, this group of six, Proust and Colette are the two who still are read widely. Uh, who, I mean, who the, the two celebrations are proof of their uh, uh, popularity. So you see, there are plenty of reasons to confront Proust and Colette. And of course, they knew each other. As I said, uh, they were members of the same uh, salon in the 1890s in Paris. Colette arrived in Paris in 1893, uh, just after she married uh, Willy, Henri Gauthier Villard, and uh, uh, they, in particular, uh, both Proust and Colette and her husband, Henri Gauthier Villard, uh, were uh, frequent guests of the salon of uh, Madame Armand de Caillavé, uh, Madame Ar Ar Armand de Caillavé, who was the mistress of Anatole France. So they both went to the Salon. It was, I think, every Wednesday 
there was a dinner, then people would come after dinner, there would be music. Uh, Madame Armand de Caillavé uh, is one of the models for Madame Verdurin in the Recherche, and she also appears in Claudine à Paris. So uh, we have the same model for the, the, this woman who has a, a, a major salon, both in Proust and in Colette. And of course, when Proust and Colette uh, met in Paris around 1895 in this salon, they didn't get along very well. They were not the same type. Uh, Proust, of course, was, uh, was a snob. Uh, Proust uh, was uh, probably quite heavily gay, and Colette was uh, brazen, fearless, brash, and uh, they didn't get along. They were not the same type at all in the 1890s. In a uh, in Claudine uh, à Paris, where uh, Colette introduces a gay character. Uh, uh, the gay character, in a sense, represents Proust. The Proust she knew in those uh, salons of the 1890s. And there is a passage where she mentions in the manuscript, she describes uh, the, the person she met at the salon. She calls him a petit Yupin des lettres which is really anti-Semitic, it was corrected by Willy, who corrected it, un jeune garçon des lettres. But, but Colette wrote, un petit Yupin des lettres. It gives you an idea of what she thought of Proust in 1895-1896. They were really not of the same band, although they met at in the same salon. And of course, then came the Dreyfus affair, and they were on opposite sides at the time of the Dreyfus affair. Uh, Dreyfus, uh, Proust, of course, claims to have been one of the first uh, Dreyfusards. It's a bit of an exaggeration uh, because the first Dreyfusard was Dreyfus' uh, brother, Mathieu or Bernard Lazare. But still, Proust uh, was very active in 1897-1898 in the Dreyfus affair. He is the one who obtained the signature of Anatole France, who wrote the preface to Les Plaisirs et les Jours. He obtained the signature of uh, Anatole France the day after Jacques to support Zola in his fight for a new trial of Dreyfus. While Colette and uh, and Willy, who I just said were quite anti-Semitic, were anti-Dreyfusists at the time of the Dreyfus affair. So the 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 connection is is not they knew each other in the 1890s, but of course they led very different lives. In the eight, in the 1900s, uh, it's the time of the a relationship between uh, Colette and Missy. Colette, uh, when she separates from uh, Willie, lives with a wo woman quasi officially for five or six years between 1905 and 1911. She lives with Missy, uh, the Marquise de Morny, who dresses as a woman. She is quite scandalous. Uh, she, uh, on, on stage, she acts as a mime, as a pen, in pantomimes, and she uncovers her breasts. She's, everybody in France has seen, has seen Colette's breast in the 1900s. So this is not the type uh, of Proust at all. So when do they really connect deeply? When do they, when does the connection, because they loved each other later, in the later years, when does it happen? Uh, I would say that it happens when Colette reads Combray. 
Swan's Way. She is immediately conquered by Swan's Way. And this is very striking. Uh, how does she read it? You see, they have they they are in the same milieu, so they have many common friends and relationships. Uh, the, the the man who tells Colette that she should read Combray, and she reads it in early 1914, as soon as it is published. It's published in November 1913. She is among the first readers of uh, Swan's Way, and uh, and. Uh, uh, and Combré and An Amour de Swann, the man who introduces her to uh, uh, Combré is Louis de Robert. Louis de Robert is a close friend of Proust in those years, 1912, 1913. Uh, Louis de Robert is the first reader of the, uh, of the typescript, one of the first readers of the typescript and proofs, galley and proofs of uh, uh, Swan's Way in 1913. And uh, he, there's a, 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 there are numerous letters between Proust and Louis de Robert in 1913, while he uh, reads uh, the, the proofs of uh, uh, Swan's Way and gives uh, advice to Proust. For instance, he's he doesn't like the title Swan's Way. He thinks it's banal and uh, poor. But uh, uh, he is very close to Proust, and he is the one who recommends uh, to uh, Colette that she should read Combray. As I said, she loves it. And we understand why she loves it. She loves it because there is a description of the village, Combray. And I think that we can say that she would be influenced by Combré when she starts describing Saint-Sauveur, her own village in, uh, in La Maison de Claudine. So she loves it. Then what happens? Then what happens? They meet again. They meet during the war a couple of times at the Ritz Hotel where Proust uh, 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 is a uh, frequent uh, patron in those years, 1917, 1918, he goes to the Ritz and he has dinner with Colette. They meet there and they, they reconnect, but they reconnect. And at that point, she has been so impressed by, uh, by the book that the, the, the reservations are completely uh, uh, forgotten at that point. And at that point also, Proust uh, reads, uh, reads uh, uh, Colette, and there is a beautiful letter uh, in 1919 after Proust has read Mitsu. Mitsu, which is a short novel, or a sh between a short story and a novel. And he is very moved by Mitsu, and we can also understand why. Uh, he's moved by Mitsu because it's the it's the story it's a story that takes place during the war in Paris between a, uh, a little actress of the music hall Mitsu and a lieutenant who is in Paris uh, during the war for a uh, leave on leave from the trenches and from the front. And uh, of course, as you know, Proust at that point is writing about the war. In Le Temps Retrouvé, we have those long passages on the war seen from Paris uh, in the years uh, 1917, uh, uh, that period of the war. So they both work on the war seen from uh, not the front, but uh, the uh, arrière, the back of the war. And, and they learn from each other in those years. And so in the, in the final years of Proust's life, let's say between 1919 and his death in 1922, the mutual admiration is obvious. They write each other, they send their books with with inscriptions 
that are very complementary. And uh, they, of course, one could say uh, there's an alliance between Colette and Proust between 1919 and 1922 because they are, I think we can say they are the most important writers in those years. Proust is already a classic. Proust received the, uh, was awarded the Prix Goncourt in 1919 for the jeune fille. So his eminence is obvious, he is already, I mean, he is acknowledged as a great writer. And I would say that Colette too. Colette is, uh, is a great writer already. Colette has been a great writer since very early on. When she published the Claudine in 1900, she was immediately uh, recognized. In 1910, she had a couple of uh, uh, votes in her favor for the Prix Goncourt. In 1919, her reputation is obvious. In 1920, she publishes uh, Chérie, Chérie, which is probably one of the best novels, uh, one of her masterpieces. And with Chérie, everybody, uh, knows that Colette is a great writer. So I think this is there is a sort of interplay between Colette and Proust. Of, also, in those years, Colette is the uh, literary director of the of a major daily, Le Matin. Le Ma so uh, so Colette, in a sense, is a powerful woman. Uh, she uh, she can uh, 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 order uh, articles on Proust for Le Matin. So I think that in those years there is a complicity between Proust and Colette uh, in those years. They appreciate each other, they recognize each other, and of course uh, Proust will uh, soon die. Very young, as I said, at 50, and in the 30 years that follow, that follow uh, 1922 until uh, Colette's death in 1954, she will write, she will come back many times. She will write at least, I would say, I haven't counted them, but I, I would say it's at least six pieces on post in various uh, publications. Uh, at the same time on, about her memories of Proust and also on her work. So uh, I think that Proust liked Colette and Proust and Colette loved Proust, even though, as I said, initially when they first met, they, they couldn't really get along. So of course you said, uh, is it the same, uh, are they both, as great writers. Uh, last year, after I, I spoke on Colette and Proust, I don't remember where, one of my uh, old colleagues from the Sorbonne, someone I really respect, came to me and said, uh, will you agree that Proust is a grand écrivain, but Colette is a bon écrivain? Uh, Proust is a great writer, but Colette is a good writer. And I said, no, I don't agree. I think they are both great writers. I think uh, Proust is a great writer, obviously. And I think that Colette is not only a good writer. As I said, she was always popular. She wrote a number of bestsellers in the 1920s and 1930s. Uh, and even the Claudine, the first series of the Claudine, which she didn't sign, was a was an excellent was was a bestseller, so she wrote a number of bestsellers. And we and you know we have this prejudice: if it sells, it's not a good book. Remember what Zola said after La Sommoir: uh, "Si ça se vend, c'est mauvais signe." If it sells, uh, from the point of view of posterity, it's not good. Uh, well, uh, Colette uh, sold many books in her lifetime. And I think she is a great writer. And I would put her 
in the same league as Proust, if you want my conclusion. Well, um, Proust, in his books, he says that work of a genius is not going to be understood by his contemporaries. It's the future generations who would understand the works of a genius better. But you're right. I mean, they are... Um, um, I think what, what is um, really common between the two is that both of them revolution, revolutionized the writing. I mean, Colette, what she writes about uh, women's experiences and their everyday life and the concept of feminine desire is something that was not done before. And Proust with his writing, you know, the um, famous for his stream of consciousness, again, is something that was not done. So they both really inf influenced the 20th century style of writing. So, um, you you know, you're a Proust scholar, you know that, uh, that you have written extensively and even given um, lectures and uh, taught courses on Proust. Your book on Colette, and Ete avec Colette is the only book you have done on um, on Colette, um, and um, I just finished reading it. It's um, I found it uh, an extraordinary study of not only Colette. Uh, here is the uh, cover of your book. Not only Colette and her work, but it's full of insights into um, into the similarities between their writing. And you said something that very intriguing. At least it it intrigued me a lot. And you said that um, um, Colette discovered uh, involuntary memory before Proust. Um, do you like to elaborate on that? I, I think that's very interesting. Well, uh, involuntary memory is not a great invention. Everybody experiences involuntary memory. I, I simply wanted to say that in, in uh, Claudine uh, à Paris, there is an episode of involuntary memory, but we all, I think most of us, experienced involuntary memory, but we didn't write uh, the research. So uh, Proust of involuntary memory made uh, a masterpiece. What, what connects Proust and Colette deeply is that they're both writers of sensation. Sensation and sensibility is at the uh, essence of both Proust and Colette. And I would say a mistrust of intellect. They don't want to be intellectuals. They want to base their art on sensation. And this is also, I think this is what Colette realized when she read Combré, which she didn't expect that this uh, snobbish uh, uh, gay uh, uh, guy that she met in the Salon would be able to write such a fantastic uh, uh, description of experiences of sensation, sensations as he does in Combré. And she realized that they were close, that they were similar from the point of view of, uh, yes, basing their art on sensations and not on intellect. So, uh, yes, yes, they are very close from uh, that point of view. But of course, they, uh, uh, their writing style is very different. So we have to what they do with those sensations is very different. When you read the first page of uh, Claudine à l'école, I mean, Claudine, the first page of Claudine à l'école is very impressive by uh, its short, very short sentences, very modern, very modern. And when you compare it with uh, longtemps je me suis couché de bonheur, etc., the first page of uh, uh, Swan's Way, we are in a completely different style. Nevertheless, they are very close. Uh, they are very innovative, both of them, innovative. Uh, when I am asked, what is a great writer? I say they are both great writers. 
a great writer is someone after whom the French literary language is no longer exactly the same. Uh, a great writer is someone who has introduced an inflection in, uh, in literary prose. And they both did. And there are not that many writers who have altered uh, literary French. Uh, we, when we read Colette and when we read Proust, we know that they did that. And that, and also we know that this was immediately perceived when Proust published Combré, when Colette published Claudine, but especially the, the, the novels of the 1920s, uh, Chéri, uh, Le Blé en Herbe, etc. Uh, there was a consensus that this was a new style in order to uh, transmit this experience of sensation. So I think that they both contributed differently to uh, the evolution of literary French. Yeah, exactly. Um, my next question is about the concept of um, autofiction in both these two authors. Um, many people believe that uh, Proust La Recherche uh, is about Proust himself, that the narrator is, uh, is Marcel Proust, even though there are differences. Uh, the narrator's mother is not Jewish. The narrator is probably one of the rare male characters in the book who is 100%, you know, uh, strictly straight. There are, you know, most everybody else, all the other male characters turn out to be homosexual. Um, and, uh, but there are similarities. They both want to be authors, they're sickly and they are uh, social climbers. Um, so, um, and, but in Proust's book, this concept of autofiction is um, um, strengthened by the fact that halfway through the book, like thousands of pages after the start of the book, he all of a sudden very, you know, playfully, he says, well, let's assume that my nom de baptême is the same as the author's name, Marcel. So, we, but it's obvious, you know, usually in books, you either the narrator stays nameless all through the book, or somewhere at the start of the book, we find out what his name is. So Proust is playing mind games with us. Um, so that's why it's not obvious. Is it, you know, um, him in the book or is it uh, parts of it is him or not? Um, how about Colette? Is, um, I know that some of the books like Vagabond is her experiences after divorcing Willie and having to struggle, you know, she was very poor at the time. Um, but um, but I think she was more straightforward in um, depicting um, herself as the character in her books, right? More on her life experiences. So, well, so you mentioned the, uh, what's now considered a genre, uh, autofiction. Uh, this this is a term that was introduced uh, quite uh, recently. It didn't exist at the time of Proust and Colette. It seems to me that we can consider that they were that they were both, let's say, prophets of autofiction. They both introduced autofiction, even though uh, the concept didn't exist. Autofiction meaning that. Uh, they introduce, it's not autobiography, it's, but they introduce uh, characters that, uh, in a sense, have the name of the author. So you mentioned the passage where the uh, narrator of the recherche uh, uses the first name Marcel. In a way, we have exactly the same uh, um, figure in Proust's, in Colette's novel, which is also the most ambitious, uh, which is uh, La Naissance du Jour, uh, Break of Day, 
published in the late 1920s, which when she's really at the uh, full of her literary power. In uh, La Naissance du Jour, there is a central character whose name is Colette, and this is Colette. And, uh, and there are a number of other characters which are fictional. So there is a mixture of uh, Colette herself being a writer, present as a writer, and fiction. In fact, Colette, Colette has played with her identity all through her literary career. Remember, the first books I signed, Willie, uh, the name of her, the, the pen name of the uh, workshop of her husband, Henri Gauthier Villard. Then she will sign uh, the prose poems of uh, Livry de la Vigne, uh, Les Dialogues des Belles. They are signed Colette Willy. But remember, Colette is not her first name. Her name is Gabrielle. Colette is the name of her father, Jules Colette, Capitaine Colette. So Colette is her last name, the name of her father. So she signs Colette Willy. Then she will sign Colette de Jouvenel. When she marries Henri de Jouvenel in 1912, the first book that she signs Colette is Le Blé en Herbe. Uh, uh, how is it translated? Ripening Seed in 1923. And after that, she will always sign Colette uh, from 1923 to her death. Her pen name, her real name is Colette. And everybody calls her Colette. Bertrand de Jouvenel, when he's her lover in the 19, early 1920s, doesn't call her Gabrielle. He calls her Colette, which is her pen name, which is the name of her father. This is a bit crazy. And also, remember, she gave the name, the first name Colette to her daughter. When she had a daughter in 1913, she was called Colette, which would be forbidden today. Now, the uh, French code, according to the French code, you cannot give to a child uh, as a first name, the last name of the father or of the mother. Hmm. Because this is to create, this creates difficult situations, a difficult situation which was created for Colette's uh, daughter. So Colette played with her identity in her work all through her life until uh, the end. And uh, yes, this is something that she, I think, discovered in Proust and recognized in Proust. I think, I mean, my thesis is that after reading Proust, Colette was influenced by Proust. She was influenced in the way she could play with the village of her youth, she would influence in the way she could play with her identity in her work. And she was also influenced in ways that we might also discuss the way she could treat uh, sexuality uh, in her work. Yes. So, so I think uh, Colette got a lot from Proust, uh, from reading Proust, and she was a good reader of Proust. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you mentioned sexuality. Of course, they, I mean, you said something about Proust being a snob, and Colette was not, of course. But um, there, there are other differences. Like Proust was wealthy, and Colette had to struggle. I mean, yeah. Proust was wealthy until towards the end of his life, and he lost all his investments. Um, but they were all, Proust also was very, uh, he didn't like scandals. Like he even invited Jean Lorraine to a duel because he called him a shushut, which sort of means precious or um, insinuates that he's homosexual. He didn't like that. Um, Colette, on the contrary, she thrives on scandal. She, like you said, she bared her breast and she kissed her uh, woman lover on the stage that, you know, 
ended up closing, I think, the play or something. So they, they were two different people. But sexuality of all different kinds, it's something that is in, inherent part of both these two authors' writings. Um, mm -hmm. Colette, however, she criticized Proust for not understanding the truth about um, uh, love between women. She said, I mean, this is something I learned by reading your book, Anetea with Colette. She said that he dedicated twice as much of his writing to Sodom than to Gomorrah. Um, and she, of course, wrote about lesbianism openly. She identified as one. And as you said, she left her husband really for a woman. So that says a lot about her. But do you like to comment on this aspect? Yes, yes, yes. First, on what you said about uh, Proust being wealthy and uh, Colette uh, being, uh, well, uh, she came from the bourgeoisie, but a bourgeoisie that had no more money. I mean, that uh, her father just uh, didn't manage the money, uh, the wealth of the family well. So Colette always said that she, so that this introduces a big difference between Proust and Colette. Proust, when you read uh, Proust's Recherche, it's about a writer's vocation, about being a writer. It's all Proust has to do with becoming a writer, a literary vocation. Mm -hmm. While Colette always said that she was not a writer. She wrote in order to make money. She, be she became a journalist, but she would have done, she was also an actor, she was a dancer, uh, she was a comedian, uh, she, uh, was a she, she was a journalist uh, mainly. She even sold uh, cosmetics. She would do anything to earn money. And she always claimed that she didn't have a literary vocation. She hated that word. She hated literature. She always said no literature. No literature was the motto of her writing. So there is a very a major opposition between Proust and Colette. And I think it has to do with uh, being a man and being a woman. Uh, a, a literary vocation is a man's business, a man's ambition. It's men who want to be famous writers. Colette didn't want to be a famous writer. She wanted to, she wrote because it was a way of making money. Then there is uh, sex, as you said. Uh, Colette, when she read Sodom et Gomorrah, immediately wrote to Proust that this was a, a major book. This was, she was, she said, I always wanted to write on homosexuality and you did it and you did it and I can no longer do it. But then this, she didn't write to Proust, but she said later that Proust, uh, there was nothing to say on Sodom after Proust, but there was everything to say about Gomorrah because Proust hadn't understood anything about Gomorrah. And the explanation, so one of the most ambitious books of Colette is Le Pur et l'Impur, uh, The Pure and the Impure, which was published in 1931-32 under another title, C'est Plaisir, and then uh, took the, the title Le Pur et l'Impur. It's not a novel, it's not a narrative, it's really an essay. It's the most theoretical, I said there is no theory in Colette, but in Le Pur et l'Impur, it's speculative. She wants to write an essay on various uh, sexual transgressions. So uh, a number of sexual transgressions are analyzed in Le Pur et l'Impur. And of course, the most the 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 most chap numerous chapters are on uh, lesbianism. There are four chapters on lesbianism in Le Pur et l'Impur. There is only one on uh, Don Juanism, 
one on uh, uh, on uh, Saddam, on male homosexuality, but the, the central part is on female homosexuality. And uh, Colette analyzes all aspects of sexual, of a, uh, of, uh, of, uh, uh, of a female homosexuality. And her theory, her thesis is that Gomor doesn't exist. Gomor doesn't exist while Saddam exists. Uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, today feminists would consider it a bit anachronistic and a bit, uh, let's say, perhaps even uh, homophobic. So I, they wouldn't agree with uh, this uh, theory. But still, uh, it's probably the most uh, daring of uh, Colette's books. And we cannot forget nowadays that uh, Colette is one of the first writers who explicitly dealt with uh, uh, transsexuality, uh, which, uh, which Proust didn't touch upon. Which nobody touched upon at the time, and uh, as I said, Colette had a much experience of it because she lived for many years with a woman who wanted to be a man, who dressed like a man, lived like a, like a man, behaved like a man. So she knew about it first hand and wanted to write about it. So uh, uh, yes, and I think that le pur et l'impur is a response to Proust, Saddam, and Gomorrah. So it's another powerful connection between the two, one of many. Yeah, um, we don't have much time and we have some questions, but I wanted just to say um, quickly that um, I found something very poetic in your book about Colette. You said for her, she saw everything in blue, not only the sky and the sea that are blue, but also the air the rain, the milk, the day. I, th I thought that was interesting and rather poetic. So before um, question and answers, um, you, um, um, I know you're busy with your project at Louvre Museum. Um, you're going to be very busy next year because it's another anniversary coming up, right? Colette's death in 1954. Uh -huh. It's going to be seven years, so be prepared. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, but are you working on a new book that you like to share with us? No, 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 I'm not, I'm no, I'm not working on a book at this point. I have okay. to, uh, I have to take some, uh, take a break. Yeah. <laughs> okay, good. good oh, there's good. one issue that we should probably discuss, which we haven't discussed, is the role of the mother. Yes, and that was one of my questions, but uh, we don't have much time. But please go so ahead. Maybe just a can word on the mother. A little bit. Yeah. Uh, uh, again, the mother, the mother, as we know, is uh, Saint-Tron in, uh, in, in Combray and the whole of Proust's novel. But uh, Colette will say uh, later in her life that her mother, Sido, uh, is the most important character in my life, she said, le personnage uh, central de ma vie. So there again, it's the confusion between life and uh, fiction. And in fact, Sido, after she died in 1912, be not before, but after she died, became ever more important in the novel. And we should mention the book that is called Sido, Sido, which is one of the most beautiful ones, which is an evocation of the mother. So the mother childhood, we might suggest that it's also a theme that Colette thought she could explore after reading Proust, because she didn't explore it before uh, the publication of Combré. It's only after reading Combré that she found a way to uh, explore literally uh, her mother and her childhood. Yeah, and that sort of also goes with that semi-autobiographical nature of Proust's writing because he wrote those two uh, chapters, Combray, based on his own childhood experiences 
at Ilie or Ilie Cambrai now. Yes. yes. Um, okay, Rone, do you, yeah. could you please? Uh, Thank, thank you, Farishtay, and thank you, Professor Compagnon. We have we have a couple of questions in the chat that I think have already been addressed by Professor Compagnon, but we one in particular, as you had mentioned, that 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 Colette um, was very much influenced by Combray. Um, Manuel Uberti is asking, could Proust have been influenced by any of Colette's early works? Could uh, Proust have been influenced by Colette's early work? Uh, the uh, Colette's early work being uh, the the Claudine, uh, uh, being the the Claudine written uh, under the uh, the signature of uh, Willy. Uh, what aspects of Colette could have influenced uh, Proust? Uh, perhaps the presence of the homosexual character, uh, as I said in Claudine à Paris. Uh, uh, there is a uh, young homosexual character, which is uh, by chance called Marcel. It's a coincidence. Is it a coincidence? I don't know, because she knew Proust uh, in those years. Uh, the introduction of, there, there are not many homosexual characters in French novels before Colette in 1900 or 1901. Uh, but I don't think we have any uh, reference to the Claudine in uh, Proust. He certainly was aware of the novels. Uh, as I said, the first book that Proust mentions is Mitsu in 1919. And this is because of the war circumstances, the war seen from Paris. We have a few more questions. Just two more questions if we have time. Um, Alan Wolfsey is asking, can you please comment on Proust's Jean Santeuil? On Proust Jean Santeuil? But Proust Jean Santeuil uh, has not much to do with Colette. It was never published between 1952, uh, uh, two years before Colette died. Uh, there's not much connection. Uh, I don't see exactly what I could say. Uh, of course, uh, in Jean Santeuil, there is a lot about the Dreyfus affair. As, uh, and as I suggested uh, on the Dreyfus in the Dreyfus case, uh, Colette and Proust were on opposite sides uh, of the commitment. I don't see much what I could say about uh, Jean Santeuil uh, through the Colette connection. Yeah. Thank there you. Are, and there are echoes of, uh, of it in La Recherche. Uh, but mm -hmm. yeah, you're right, there is nothing. Um, mm -hmm. So I um, think we have one more question. Um, Professor Beth Gershnesik is asking, Professor Compagnon, did you read the letters between Colette and André Samon, who became a journalist invited by Colette? Uh, I don't remember reading those letters. Uh, no, André Salmon, no, I don't remember reading those letters. There, Colette wrote a lot. I mean, there are many volumes of uh, letters uh, uh, from Colette. Unfortunately, we don't have the letters to her mother, which were destroyed, which would have been uh, the most important uh, uh, collection of letters. And then we just have a final comment in case you have time to join us at some point in the future that Emily is asking, I would love to hear a future presentation on Proust and Montaigne. Ah, Proust and Montaigne. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot to say about Proust and Montaigne, as there's a lot to say about Proust and Colette. Well, uh, uh, Proust and Montaigne. Proust and Montaigne, what's so impressive about the two is that they both uh, died before finishing the book. Uh, there was, and also that they wrote a single book. Uh, this is a big difference about Proust and Colette, which we didn't even think of mentioning. Proust uh, wrote one book, À la recherche du temps perdu. Colette wrote, uh, I don't know, 30 or 40 books, one after each other, one almost every year. Uh, Colette, uh, Proust 
it's it's always a question what could Proust have written after the recherche if he hadn't died so young? Of course, he would have written nothing because his uh, destiny was to die writing the recherche as uh, Montaigne died adding marginalia uh, in the essays. There are books about death, both the recherche and the essays. So, yes, there's a lot to say about Proust and Montaigne. Well, Professor Compagnon and Ferris de Prio, thank you so much for an extraordinary presentation. I'm watching things go up in the chat. Présentation passionnante, merci. Um, I think everybody it was ab is absolutely thrilled with the presentation, and we look forward to welcoming you back. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Happy Thanksgiving to everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Antoine Compagnon. Thank you. Bye-bye.